So today's presentation is going to be about color for photographers. And what I hope to do is demystify the concept of color spaces. Now this is going to be practical. Uh, we'll be uh, relating this to the basic photographic process. And I will want to uh, define a color space, talk a little bit about trisimilis, uh, how a camera records colors, how printers print colors, and how do we get these colors to match. Now, color theory uh, varies a lot depending upon who you're talking to. Uh, as a physicist, I might be interested a lot about uh, spectra and uh, so forth. Uh, not so much about human vision or even color spaces. And if I was in graphics arts, uh, that I might be concerned a lot about color schemes. Uh, in this particular presentation, we are going to focus on the uh, idea of how colors are perceived. Generally, a color space is the range of colors that something can detect or record or reproduce. And of course, a human being is uh, such an instrument, so there is a color space for human vi vision. In humans, all perceived colors can be differentiated by just three values. The reason for this is because there are just three different types of color sensing receptors in the eye. And because there are such uh, three different set receptors that are stimulated, we call this the tri stimulus. And here's a little picture. I think you've seen this before, just showing a representation of the retina with the uh, cone cells that uh, pick up on color. Now each such receptor is stimulated by a photon that is in a very broad range. We call this the L long middle port. Look at the diagram. See that these heavily overlap. That means that a given photon, given wavelength, will uh, stimulate uh, almost always at least two of these and sometimes all three. It's impossible to stimulate a receptor by itself. The three values can be expressed in several schemes. We could have the LMS scheme that would simply be a measure of uh, how much each receptor has been stimulated. RGB for red, green, blue. HSB for hue, saturation, and brightness, and then LXY, which is luminance and a pair of coordinates that represent a combined response. So let's start with our LMS color space. It's the range of colors that is seen by most humans. However, it happens that some females have four different color receptors. They have a tetrastimulus as opposed to the tristimulus. And as a consequence, uh, they can distinguish more colors than typical. And by the way, I should mention that women that tend to have this have a grandfather that uh, was slightly colorblind. And there are some males that have muted receptors and distinguish fewer colors. Most common being uh, a difficulty in uh, differentiating reds and greens. It's very slight. So the human vision color space was measured. This was first done back in 1931 by the International Commission on Illumination. And in uh, French, uh, their initials were CIE. And they defined the standard color space for uh, people. Oh, by the way, that, that is why women often uh, do tend to see colors that uh, men do not. Green is quite different from the... We're just kind of staring and going, what? <laughs> But yes, they do see different colors. Uh, anyway, uh, CIA, they measure the LMS color space. 
and they did that by using what they referred to as the CIE 1931 Standard Metric Observer. Two degree refers to the fact they used a particularly small section of uh, human retina, the most sensitive part for looking at color. Now, who was the Standard Observer? Well, Standard Observer was a bunch of English schoolboys. Basically, they looked at pure spectra then tried to match the color by using adjustable filters. From the measured LMS color space, they constructed another representation, which is called the LXY color space, because intensity, luminance, <clears throat> is heavily weighting the M response, basically green, over the L and S response, red and blue. In the LXY color space is defined as the colors a normal human can see. And bear in mind when I say normal, I simply mean the middle of the distribution of variation of color sight. It's, you know, hardly the same for everybody. In this representation, the X value is close to the amount of red. The Y value is close to the amount of green. The amount of blue can be tamed from X and Y given that the luminance value is fixed. Don't worry about luminance. Refer to you that any color hue and saturation can be by just the two numbers x and y. <clears throat> so basically, we can have a two-dimensional plot to play colors. And as I said, two-dimensional plots. So in summary, the range of colors for a fixed luminance uh, is a color space. When the luminance is specified. The color space is two-dimensional. There are some alternatives. I already mentioned hue, saturation, and brightness. And if we only look at hue and saturation and not brightness, <clears throat> again, that is just a two-dimensional color space, just two values. And we can also use three standard color bands and define those as red, green, uh, and blue. I don't know why I put down red twice here. I have to correct this slide. But uh, red, green, and blue, uh, which would be measured by some artificial specimens, some filters that we designate as The hues are the colors that a single photon might convey. And these are the rainbow colors. You know, or as we would say in physics, the pure spectral colors. Let me just bring this one little chart forward back here. And, okay. These are the spectral hues, the hues of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Um, <clears throat> but I want you to notice something. And that is, is that in the rainbow, you don't see the color brown, or purple, or gray. Those are actually not hues. Those are made by combination of hues, and we refer those as, in general as being color. Now, I'm going to flip this around if I can. It was Isaac Newton that first observed that light can be broken up into these spectral hues. And he also observed that all the colors you see can be made by combining two of the hues. Uh, and from this he produced the color wheel. This is the Newton color wheel. And it displays all the colors of a given fixed luminance. The spectral hues, the ones in the rainbow, start here with red and go around this side of the color wheel down to blue. Get the idea. Um, the section in the lower left between red and blue, the magenta area, uh, is in fact not found in the spectral hues and is only seen when you combine uh, 
uh, various degrees of red and blue and uh, perhaps another color. Okay, I'll put this away. Put up there. Okay, I mentioned the pure spectral colors were the outer rim of the color wheel. In our LXY plot, they form this rim here. And let me see if I can get my little corner up. Can y'all see that little red dot that I just put here? Um, this is the extreme red going toward the green, coming around down toward the blue. So you can see in this particular kind of plot, my x-axis basically corresponds to the amount of red. Not precisely. It's actually a fairly complicated algebraic relationship between this and the response on the retina. And the y-axis is like the response of the green. So here we'll put some colors on there. And you can see that we have red and green and blue at the... Uh, outer limits of the uh, diagram. Gray kind of toward the center. Brown is sort of a mix of uh, red and green and then actually a little purple is between the uh, blue and the red. In fact we call this lower line here, here and here as the line of purple. Well by the way let me go back one. Inside are the colors we can see. Outside <clears throat> are mixes that are possible, but you won't perceive them. And the reason is that there is no way to get your receptors in the retina to respond to these ratios or produce these ratios in your mind. So in this area out here, Basically, you would say there are colors that uh, uh, would not be differentiated by a, a human being. Uh, unless you use some extraordinary measures, such as uh, finding a way to stimulate uh, receptors individually. Uh, you know, perhaps a, a tight little laser beam that would target just a single receptor. Now on the uh, XY plot, we can show how mixing two or three primary colors will produce a non-primary color. For example, mixing red, green, and blue to make gray. By mixing two of the spectral colors uh, in a desired proportion, we can produce any color inside the spectral curve. Uh, green can be a primary. Uh, it uh, depends upon the color scheme you wish to use. You know, printers will use uh, cyan, yellow, and magenta uh, and mix to black, uh, whereas uh, physicists and photographers will use red, green, and blue. Another way to look at it is that color saturation can be a position along a line from the spectral color to the center gray. And again, by uh, looking as that as uh, going from a sharp spectral line, produce any color. Let's see, almost. There's still a problem with the line of purple. So. We can produce any color of a given luminance by mixing the appropriate pair of hues. And uh, we can also produce any color of, by desaturating a hue. And except for the purples. Go back here real quick. This line here between red and blue is my line of purples. And for there, I basically have to mix three different uh, 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 hues in order to get uh, any part of the, the purple region.
Oh, and I had a slide for that. I forgot I had a slide for it that shows the line of purples. But this uh, lower line here you see is that line for magenta and the other purples. Now, white, gray, and black are the same color. They're just different luminance. So we call the center of the plot the white point. Uh, it might more properly be called the gray point. Uh, in any given scene, white is simply the brightest gray and black is simply the darkest gray. You will often find that uh, uh, the black is not so black and the white is not so white. Okay, so just to reiterate, uh, the human color space is the spectral curve uh, that makes a boundary in the XY plot that humans can see as separate colors. You only see the inside. You cannot differentiate the stimulus and the outside. It doesn't mean those can't exist. It means you can't uh, see them with your retina. Okay, so the uh, CIE diagram shown here. And as I said, this was first measured back in 1931 by having uh, young English boys adjust filters to match uh, pure spectral hues. There are various things marked on here. Uh, you see that black line in the middle, that's is, uh, what thermal radiation would give you different temperatures. You recall we talk about red hot steel and orange hot steel and so forth. This is also the same, incidentally, for the spectra of stars in terms of their surface temperature. Um, yeah, so that's your thermal radiation. Um, So, that was for human vision. Now, what happens when you have a camera or a printer? Well, cameras will use color filters that uh, are, are the analog of uh, the receptors of the human retina. And the choice of those filters will determine what subset of the human color space will be recorded by the camera. So, the first thing to consider is that uh, the camera is always going to record fewer colors than a human being can see. Early in uh, digital imaging development, uh, HP and Microsoft collaborated to come up with a color space that would be suitable for digital cameras and displays. And this was in 1996. And as you can see, I, I said ancient history because from the computer and electronic standpoint that was a long time ago. These values are called the standardized red, green, and blue, or sRGB. Bear in mind, though, that when I say RGB, I do not mean exactly red, green, or blue. The IEC, uh, about uh, three years later, accepted sRGB as a default standard for imaging. And in that standard, the colors in each of the channels is divided up into an 8-bit number. Uh, now, that seemed to be adequate, that uh, human beings uh, could not really differentiate if you had smaller divisions. And that applies to devices that use specific filters for sensing the color and specific dyes for displaying the color. Now here it is shown on the uh, CIE gamut. Uh, by the way, gamut is a, uh, another name for range. It actually comes out of medieval music. Uh, it was the uh, lower limit local range. Modern times, gamut came Now, you see these triangular vertices I've marked on the diagram here. 
and here, here. Those represent the uh, filter values that serve as uh, reference for the sRGB, or you prefer the primary illuminance if I was using uh, uh, these to uh, filter light. And I've uh, marked down the XY vector. Now, that's kind of small. Let's jump back to here. All of this area out here in this green around here. is a color that will not be recorded correctly by the sRGB scheme. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> all this information you might see in nature, you're not going to see in a photograph. So it's just a small triangle inside that full uh, SIE gamut. Now, photographic films had a much larger extent. Uh, and that is one of the complaints that uh, photographers had in the transition to digital, that uh, uh, the colors were becoming less vibrant, less, uh, more muted. You would think maybe we can do better. You know, I mean... 1999 was a long time ago now, and we might have better filters and better display technology and so forth. Adobe, a year before the IEC made sRGB a years after, they came up with their own color space called the Adobe R. And the specific reason was they looked at sRGB and said that's just too small. Uh, and Adobe does have a lot of clout, so they could compete with their alternative to the IEC SR. So I have to emphasize that uh, as an international standard, it is still sRGB. They made a little error in their first try back in 1998, and they revised it, but that means that you are now confused by having two different Adobe 1998 and you have official Adobe standard. So now we have three different standards. We have the sRGB, the Adobe 1998, which a lot of stuff was recorded in, and the Adobe, uh, the current uh, Adobe RGB. Now here's the Adobe color space, and you can see that it's considerably larger, and in particular, it captures a lot more greens than the sRGB does. So it gets more greens and blues. It is also designed to work with ICC color management tools for printing. And you will find that most professional cameras will allow you to choose between sRGB and Adobe RGB for recording an image. And here I show them together, and you can just see that the uh, sRGB triangle is inside the Adobe one. Now, more recently, we've come up with a new color space called the Pro Photo Color Space. Now, why did that happen? It happened because uh, in digital cinema, they can record and display more colors than we could previously with the filters and professional uh, cameras. In particular, uh, for digital cinema, there is a laser scanning detection tech uh, that can display a huge range of colors over that. So Kodak came up with Pro Photo. And it's actually even a little bit larger than the old chemical film color space. And I should note that it's actually been adopted by Adobe as a default 
Color Spaces in the Adobe Lightroom Editor. Let's see if I can bring forward the uh, picture of that. Okay. Just to show you, let me scoot it over a bit. This is the uh, Pro Photo Color Space. And uh, <clears throat> still misses some greens, but it does capture much, much more of the uh, human vision color space than the uh, previous standards. One rather interesting aspect is you can actually encode into Pro Photo regions, such as lower left, top, that um, <clears throat> represent colors that cannot be differentiated by human vision. Uh, and uh, about 12% of the Pro Photo color space is like that. Let's put this away. And come back to here. Okay, now let's see what happens when we're using a uh, <clears throat> pattern of filters to record a color with a camera. Well, a uh, green filter such as this one might be measuring uh, a broad area that's above this green fuzzy line here. And the blue filter might be measuring a broad area that is to the lower left. Red filter might be in a broad red fuzzy line. And the color I want to measure is somewhere in the overlap of those three filters. When I've measured that color, okay, I will come up with some values. And I've given an example down here of 0.5, 0.6, and 0.2. Just remember that. Uh, these really aren't red, green, blue. They're close, but uh, not really the same thing. Now we're going to print with three inks. So I have my three measured values of RGB, and I happen to have three inks that are called red, green, and blue. But again, not exactly. So here on my CIE diagram, I've marked down uh, where the inks might be. We have a green ink, a red ink, and a blue ink. And I've put down that color that I, I want to print. Well, I print it, and guess what happens? The recorded color doesn't look a bit like the printed color, simply because my inks and my filters don't match. Okay? I was just very naive. I thought that if I measured something that was like red, green, and blue with a camera, and then printed something, used red, green, and blue inks that somehow the same. They're not. <clears throat> what we have to do is mathematically alter the recorded color values to match the reproduction to the original. And that's the reason we have to use a standard color space. So, um, we know that cameras record colors by using color filters. And I won't get into it in this talk, but it uses a uh, pattern called the Bayer pattern or uh, dichromic prisms. The camera processor right inside your camera will adjust the digital values to conform to the sRGB or the Adobe or HDTV for that matter. And when you print, the printer driver, say for example, uh, the Canon driver for the Canon printers, will adjust the digital values to conform to the ink colors. Your precise work requires that you set up all these adjustments correctly. Here's the same subject, same camera, but done with two different color spaces. To tell you the truth, I'm kind of lying to you here because I had to manipulate this to get. I want to pray. 
but on one side you can see what the Adobe color space might give, and on the right you can see what the sRGB color space. Might give. And if you look carefully, you can see that yeah, I've I've kind of muted the greens and I've kind of broadened out the red uh, in each one. If I looked at them separately, I might even not even notice that anything was wrong. It's only by comparison that uh, I, I see that one had a bit better range of color than the other. Now besides my sRGB and my Adobe RGB, and I mentioned the Pro Photo, uh, there are other color spaces. Uh, there's one called Color Match, there is the uh, PAL system for television, the HDTV system, NTSC, uh, and so forth. And each of these has a different purpose. It's for different devices. The iPhone color space is unique for itself. Uh, it's been designated as Display P3. It's close to sRGB, but it's not the same. And uh, that again is handled for you invisibly because when you uh, import the images, the software you're using is going to adjust these different color spaces. Just so you know, here's the HDTV color space, uh, again shown within the SIE uh, gamut. So, you have to choose the color space you want to use and you have to be consistent. Stick with that color. Each device you use is calibrated to match particular color space, its inherent color space, to your chosen color space. Such matching is done by having specimens such as this color card. Uh, you would take a uh, photo with it, you would display it on your screen, and then you would uh, adjust your screen parameters so that the colors match the original. And that's actually usually done by an automatic system. Various uh, little fold against. Look at each little square of color. Or what it thinks the color is, then make a uh, algebraic adjustment to play parameters, get everything to match. Uh, and uh, many professional photographers will go through this exercise for each display and each printer that they use. Three ink printers, as we've already seen, uh, can only do colors inside the triangle that's. Uh, uh, mapped by their inks. Six ink printers will have an irregular hexagon like this. They can do more and, and therefore will produce a more higher quality print for you. But when you calibrate a given printer for a given color space, you're doing all this mapping of the outside to the inside and uh, trying to get the color spaces to fit, you don't ever have true color fidelity. You're going to think there is, but it will always be somewhat different. So the colors you see in a movie or video display or printed are not true of what you would see in the original scene with your own natural by the way, uh, color grading is the uh, uh, choice of a color space minimum. It's a very big deal. If you look at uh, the differences between films, between DVDs, you will see there's been quite a change to color grading. There was a time when, uh, I think in the 50s, when all the colors really popped. They were strongly differentiated. These days, they're a bit more muted, I think. And if you really want to see what the Mona Lisa looks like, the only way you'll ever know is by going to Paris. And you're not going to tell from a book. So, we see colors a camera cannot accurately record. The, color, the camera records colors we cannot display. The display shows colors we cannot print. But fortunately, human color adaption comes into play. It kind of saves us. 
And the reason for that is that the visual cortex will automatically average a scene to gray. It simply assumes that uh, all colors are more or less evenly represented. So it will adjust its color perception uh, uh, so that the average of that scene is gray. Now, if you've ever worked in a semiconductor fab, as I have, know that they use yellow light and certainly the sensitive films, coating wafers and circuits. And it takes a very short amount of time after you've stepped into that room for the yellow to disappear and for you to feel like you're just seeing normally. And it's only to later when you bring something outside and you suddenly say, oh my goodness, you know, that this that I thought was green, in fact, was blue. Uh, <clears throat> you do adapt to it. Uh, there's also what we call the land effect. That's after Edwin Land. Uh, the inventor of Polaroid, uh, and that is is that gray areas will tend to fill in with complementary colors. So if I uh, have a small bits of gray surrounded, that gray will tend to be complementary to the surrounding colors. Okay, <clears throat> so one thing that's useful is having a standard language for color communication and that's implemented several ways. I've already shown you the color swatches that uh, we use and also the color sensors that uh, we put over top of uh, displays to uh, calibrate them. Uh, I should also mention the Panatone uh, hexachrome color system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you work in the graphics arts uh, you were often very accustomed to seeing someone marking down a Panatone designation for an area. Have maybe yellow or something, and they would put a little arrow on it and said, not what you see, but instead this Panatone. Okay, so uh, that covers what I wanted to hit on today. Uh, we'll open it for questions. I I think I missed some of these that you had put into the uh, chats. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, re ask if you wish. Okay, nothing uh, anyone wants to ask about? Yeah, what? Well, actually, um, <clears throat> you can. Um, some animals are, uh, instead of having tristimulus, have just two color receptors. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for such a diagram, it would basically become one-dimensional. Uh, you know, they would not uh, uh, have a lot of differentiation. And of course, we mentioned that human, some human females have four types of receptors. Uh, and uh, uh, the CA diagram would not be correct for them either. They would have a, a much broader, differently shaped diagram. <clears throat>
Well, basically, for those that can see into the uh, UV or the infrared, uh, you would take the uh, spectral curve <clears throat> and you would extend it further uh, uh, than we show on the diagram. Uh, so there would be uh, considerably more portions uh, toward the uh, lower right than a human being would have. Well, you know, there's always a philosophical question, am I really seeing the same colors that someone else sees? Uh, we think we do because, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat's going. <coughs> we think we do because the colors that seem complementary to us seem complementary to other people as well. Um, but, uh, you know, you just don't really know what's going on inside another person's head. And that would also be true of artificial intelligence. And one thing I didn't even touch upon today was the question of uh, color sampling. Uh, because when you have a camera sensor, uh, you're using a, an array of filters to uh, different photoreceptors in the sensor concentrate on different colors. And uh, for most digital cameras, we have what is called the Bayer pattern that uses uh, an array of uh, two by two uh, pixels, um, four pixels altogether, where two are concentrated on green and the other two are on red and blue each. But interestingly enough, in Sun Cinema cameras, they use an array that uses just two colors. Uh, a, uh, I believe it's a blue and a green. And they synthesize the red based upon <clears throat> and then we also have uh some very high end video cameras prisms little cubes that separate out complete red, green, and blue images. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, if I was looking at luminance alone, I could uh, do a considerably more sensitive and finer gradation uh, than by doing color. And, of course, in photography, people often speak of the fact that uh, a monochrome picture, a black and white picture, seems to uh, have much better grading than... Uh, photos. That's why they'll like uh, old black and white films, they'll like black and white photos. <clears throat> Well, the uh, grain in a uh, 
uh, film. <clears throat> Depends on what film you're talking about. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the total number of pixels in many digital sensors matches the uh, available grain resolution in many. You know, we're running up to the point now where we'll soon have, uh, in common use, 70 megapixel, 100 megapixel uh, cameras. In our cell phones for... Uh, Have a timetable for that, <clears throat> but uh, I think you can expect to see very big things happening. Um, I think the chemical photography will continue for quite some time, um, simply because people like the feel and uh, quite literally the texture of it uh, more than digital reproduction. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting you mentioned music. Back in the uh, 70s, when um, <clears throat> digitized uh, audio was first introduced, there were many audiophiles that I knew that uh, complained. They said that the digitization frequency, uh, before kilohertz, was quite audible to them. They said it was like a buzzsaw going off in my head. Today, <clears throat> I run into people who will tell me that, uh, oh no, they have this this perfect CD, a, a digital golden master, and they refuse to use anything else to judge and qualify audio systems. So there's a change in perception like that. <clears throat> yes, there was a time when, for audio, you would see a uh, little designation on the uh, uh, media that would say DDD or ADD, indicating digitally or audio, digitally or audio. Very big deal for people that were into that about which uh, variation you uh, thought was best. And we do have people with super normal vision, too. Um, you know, in my much younger days, uh, not anymore, but in my much younger days, uh, when I was working in integrated circuit fabs, uh, I was often able to see details uh, through the microscope that others could not. Okay, uh, any additional questions though about color?
I don't know of any of the current uh, research on that, but uh, I would assume that probably it does change with age. Well, perhaps next time I can do one on some other technical aspects, in particular uh, a bit more on spectra and luminance. And for printing monochrome, I suggest getting a printer that uh, includes a, a photo gray ink. Well, thank you everyone for having me here today, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can uh, do some additional uh, things in the future. Well, goodbye, everyone. I guess I'll uh, sign out now, and I will see you all, I guess, uh, next week.